Hello, welcome to the session. My name is Grant Fritchie. Let's get started. As I've already said, my name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. I'm a Microsoft MVP and an AWS community builder. And if you have any questions or doubts after today, this is my contact information. If you'd like to get in touch with me, uh, ask me some questions, um, express your doubts about anything, please do reach out. This is my contact information. You've got an invite to use it. Get in touch with me. This is my blog. This is my email address. And um, you can absolutely track me down on Twitter. In any regard, I will be monitoring the session as we go along. So if you've got questions or doubts, you can also type them into the question window. So feel free to use that as well. Very, very happy to interact with anyone on pretty much any topic. So please do reach out if you've got questions and um, let's get going. Now our agenda is pretty simple. I want to talk about DevOps in Azure and how to use it to build databases. Because building databases is actually kind of hard. And getting a methodology that's going to allow you to automate your database deployments and make your database testing and everything else in an automated fashion is going to make things a lot better for you overall. There's just going to be so much more you can do and so much more you can get done in an efficient way. So it's really good to automate all your processes as much as you can. But um, you do need to understand how things work, what tools are available, and the ways that you can get it done. Now before we get started on all that, let's just level set on this concept of DevOps and, and talk about it just a little bit. Now, this is my own definition of DevOps. Um, I think it's well supported within, within uh, all, all the documentation I've ever read. I just wanted something boiled down and tight to be able to talk to people about it. And so I took my definition instead of some of the broader definitions I've seen online. I've seen very, very extensive definitions of what exactly DevOps is. But I mean, the thing is, is like we get hung up on culture. I'm sorry, on, on labels. And we need to get away from that idea that, that there's, there's these very specific labels and very specific behaviors. And it's just not true. The concept of DevOps is all about the culture. It is that agile culture, that culture that can move quickly, um, make small adjustments over time, and to support collaboration between people. It uses automation and tooling, but automation and tooling are not the driving factors of DevOps. The driving factors of DevOps is that agile culture and that collaboration and communication. It's all about the human beings involved. And so what we mean when we say this is, is just that, a culture that supports collaboration. It is not about any particular tool set. It is not about any particular operating system. I mean, I've seen people say, oh, you can only do DevOps if you're in Linux. And, and it's just not true. It's not about the tools. It's about the communication, the collaboration, the people. So let's talk about that just for a minute. It really is all about people over process. It really is all about process over tooling and ensuring that, that you've got the people in the room that need to be in the room, the people who are communicating with one another that really need to be communicating with one another, and you're finding every possible mechanism that you can to eliminate friction in, those, in that communication, to make sure that people can collaborate better. One of the best ways we can ensure that people are collaborating well is to establish a firm, solid, well-documented process through which they then communicate. That process, that process definition, is so very, very important. An understanding of exactly how we're going to deploy, exactly when we're going to deploy, exactly what we're going to deploy, and, and the mechanisms needed to support all of that, that is what's going to allow us to arrive at a DevOps process, not any particular set of tools. However, we are going to talk tools. To, today our purpose is to talk about tools and tooling and the mechanisms needed to support some kind of a DevOps process. 
And the one, the tools specifically we're going to focus on today are the Azure DevOps tools. Uh, Azure DevOps tools are really cool. There's a lot going on there. And they've been growing and supported by Microsoft for quite a while now. So they're very mature. There's a lot happening. There's, there's all kinds of things you can do. And we'll get into some of the details. I would strongly recommend you keep a, an eye on GitHub Actions. Um, Microsoft owns GitHub. And they are definitely going to be um, looking at um, using more of those in some way, um, possibly incorporating it into the Azure DevOps, possibly shifting some of the Azure DevOps over into the GitHub Actions somewhat. It's, it's something to keep an eye on. But in the meantime, Azure DevOps is very functional and it consists of a few things. The first up is the repository. Uh, that is your source code repository. And we're going to drill down on exactly what that is, um, but we'll get going on it. And then the next thing is pipelines the flow control mechanism, the mechanism for determining what we do and when we do, how we do it. And we'll run through a whole bunch of that stuff too. And then finally, it's the artifacts. It's all about being able to generate a SQL file that you can run in an automated, automated fashion uh, to, to do your database deployments. That's, that's really what it's down to. And then it's down to database deployments. And we'll talk about some of the tooling necessary for database deployments because you are going to have to get some tools involved. Um, all of this is going to require some tools, some automation, some labor, um, quite a lot of labor. It's not a question of like reinventing the wheel anymore. You don't have to build um, all new processes and your own methodologies and everything else. It really is about taking advantage of the existing tools that are out there and putting those to work. Uh, it's not hard as such but there are lots and lots of moving parts, and we'll, we're going to go through a lot of that now in this session and talk about the various tooling and, and whatnot. Now, the first thing we're going to start off with is the Azure DevOps, and Azure DevOps is pretty cool. <laughs> it really is pretty cool. It is a whole collection of different tools. Um, you don't need to use all of the tools that are available. You can ignore some of them, you can pick and choose, you can decide what you want and how you want it, but you've got a whole set of tools. It is not simply a set of automation tools either. It is an entire management system. It has got all the stuff you need to manage your database deployments, your application deployments, but also control the flow of work, determine who is working on what patch and all of that kind of information Every bit of that is within Azure DevOps. So it's not like it, it's a tiny place, it's huge. Um, but the one thing I would talk about first is security. Uh, it, it is highly dangerous to overexpose your production systems with too much uh, access to these kinds of automated uh, tools. You can um, introduce risk into your system. So you want to be very clamped down, very tight on what exactly these systems can do, who can access them, who can manipulate them directly, and then and then what they what they actually do. We're going to talk a little bit about security. I'm going to show you some of the settings and how you can control those things. Um, it should not by default be unsecure. You should be able to create it in such a way that it is very secure. However, it is entirely possible we are human we can screw it up so an emphasis on security early is going to be uh, in your favor right you know it's just a good plan to make sure that you're setting up security ahead of time so we will talk about that some but to get started what we're talking about are the repositories now the types of repositories are important to think about if we're using Azure DevOps we can define different kinds of repositories in the background. Now the old TFS, the Team Foundation Services, that repository is still available to us. So if you're comfortable with that, you've been using that for a long time, you've already got code in it, uh, you can plug that right into your repositories here in Azure DevOps and take off and get going with it. However, for a lot of us, for a very lot of us, uh, the vast majority. I mean, I think we're I think we're approaching 90% now. We're well into the 80% percentiles, but uh, are are using some flavor of Git, and so Git and GitHub are the two most likely places that you can use it. Now, you can set up your repository 
in Azure DevOps so that it is using Git natively. Or you can hook up all of your Azure DevOps pipelines through GitHub. Um, I've got examples of both. Today we're going to look just at the, at the Git repository, um, but I have examples um, using GitHub as well. Um, you can, in fact, take advantage of pretty much any repository that you can get access to from Azure DevOps. So you don't, you are not limited to these three, but these three really are the most common. And so when we talk about repositories, we are talking about maybe TFS, but probably some flavor of Git and probably um, running up in Azure and or on GitHub. So either way, that's that's the important thing. Now, the reason we're starting with repositories is because of that last sentence. Your database is code. Now, I know there's arguments to be had about that. Well, no, my data is not code. My, my database is all about my data. And, and that's true. Your, your database is all about your data. And, and the principal reason for having a database is the information that it stores. And, and you know, storing that information, retrieving that information, protecting that information. Those of us who've worked as a DBA, that's, that's our goal in life, is, is ensuring that protection is in place and that, that we're getting the right things done the right way. So that is a big deal. But we have to be clear that the definitions of our databases is code. The T-SQL data definition language that we are looking at is code. And since it is code, we should treat it the way we treat all of our other code. It goes into source control. This is a hard one for DBAs. This is a hard one for database developers. But the fact is really, really simple. Databases are code. We should treat them like code. By not treating them like code, by not approaching it, you know, if it's not in source control, it doesn't exist, that kind of an approach. I mean, and we're being very serious about it. If we're not approaching it that way, if we're like, ah, yeah, it's code, but we sometimes treat it that way, sometimes we do other things, automating all these processes is going to fail. If we're unable to treat our databases as code day one, if we're unable to maintain a discipline of treating our databases as code, a lot of this, a lot of everything else we're going to talk about is going to fail. If there are changes not represented in source control, it's going to be a problem. If there are changes made outside of the normal processes that we've defined, it's going to be a problem. We need to establish our source control systems and then use them. That is just fundamental. It is fundamental. So let's assume you're all going to get your databases in the source control and start working from there, okay? So that's, that's one thing done. Next, the pipelines. Now, pipelines is how we define process. It is how we define the flow control and the things that are going to occur in terms of the deployments. The way stuff moves through the system is determined by the pipeline. And so it makes those determinations on the flow of control. I'm going to demo one pipeline, but I'm going to show you several uh, because there are so many different ways to set up pipelines. Now the pipeline I'm going to demo is a very simple, very simple continuous integration pipeline. And its basic purpose is real, real simple. Validate that my database code will deploy successfully. That's it. That's all it does initially. Um, there's more things you could look at, more things you can do. And I'm, I'll show you some other examples with, with some additional testing and all kinds of stuff. But um, the, the, one I, the one I want to start with is that CI process. And the reason I want to start with that CI process and the reason I'm keeping it so very, very simple is because that's all I want you to do. If you've never done DevOps before, if you've never, specifically if you've never done database DevOps before, we need to start as simple as possible. That continuous integration um, methodology that I'm going to show is the simplest possible mechanism we could set up. And even it's still a lot of work. So we'll go through it and talk about it. Um, now, the nice thing about the pipelines and the way they're set up inside of uh, Azure is you can control them all up in the cloud and it can do nothing, all the activity up in the cloud, everything occurring on Azure, you know, deploying to Azure databases, deploying, you know, to, to wherever. And that's great. 
but you also have the ability to get agents and those agents can run locally they can run you know like in, in the example I'm going to have it's running on my laptop but you can also have them um, you know running on servers or other places and by having those agents you've got control over security you've got mechanisms for ensuring that hey I can pass these commands down to this agent but it can only do the commands that are passed and it's only through the agent and those agents are by design inherently secure so this is a big next step for our security is ensuring that we've got these agents configured they can only do the things that they need to do they can only access the things they need to access and yes you can set up multiple agents so you could have two agents running on a machine and one agent has access to the OS the other agent only has access to the database and and that should, way you can ensure that you know no streams get crossed nobody has too much access no one process can can take control you, you're limiting the scope of your systems and therefore adding that level of security that we need to talk about every step of the way through this process now the one thing I will say about the pipelines I'm going to show you the GUI today. I'm going to walk you through the GUI, how the GUI is set up, how it's working, all that fun stuff. But I'm telling you, you're going to have to learn some YAML. That's just the nature of the beast today. The way these things are defined and controlled and the way you're going to control it programmatically. Not, not through the GUI, because you don't want to control that much through GUIs. GUIs are, are fine for pre representation, fine for presentations like this. But when we really dig into doing automation, uh, you're going to want to be using the automation tools. And in this case, that is YAML. So plan on the idea of learning some YAML. It's just going to be a good idea for you. All right, so that's the pipelines. And again, uh, just to reiterate, uh, you've got my contact information from earlier. If there's questions, send me an email. Or I am watching as we go along. So if you've got a doubt in this area, let me know and I will try to answer it um, you know in, in, you type in type in the doubt and I will try to answer as best I can in the chat um, of the window here so next up are artifacts now artifacts are the results of our pipeline now you can set up a pipeline so it doesn't produce an artifact that's there's any number of reasons why you could do that why you would do that um, you could just be deploying the automation all the way through and that's fine but it's a good idea to generate artifacts. Why? Well, one, eyeballs. You can stop, pause, take a look at what's going on, and read the thing to see what's happening, to, so you can make a determination as to whether or not the SQL being run is good for you. You can actually put pauses into your pipelines so that you can validate stuff on the way. You, uh, I'll, show, I'll show you an example of that. I mean, I won't run the example of it, but, but I'll show you the example of setting that up. It's not hard. Also, artifacts give you auditing, and uh, auditing is so huge. It's so important because you want to be able to track what's been changed, who made the change, when did the change get made, and having um, a repository of your changes, the artifacts that you ran after the fact, is going to be a big deal in terms of laying out and determining how you're getting your job done and the methods and mechanisms that you're using to do it. Because we all live in the, the world of GDPR now. Um, it's just everywhere. It's not, it's not just one country anymore. Or, or Sorry, Europe is more than one country. I, I apologize. But um, it's not just one set of countries anymore. It's, it's pretty much all of them are dealing with it whether because we're a global organization and therefore you know we've got to deal with, with EU laws or because our own country or our own state or our own principality or municipality has passed these types of laws. So we need to have these kinds of artifacts so we can get this done. So make sure that we're generating those out of our change sets. If nothing else, it gives you the ability to still bring that Mark 1 eyeball in and take a look at the script. All right, next. Database tools. You can, through a lot of work, because I've done it, create your own mechanism for getting code out of source control and deploying the databases successfully. It is difficult. It is very difficult. 
I would plan on getting one of many tools that are out there. Now the tools come in two different flavors. The common one that you'll see the most uh, is what is called state-based. And it is comparing two states. It's taking a look at your source control and a backup. Your source control and a live database. Your source control and a set of scripts. But whatever it is, it is comparing two states and then arriving at a set of changes to move the state of one thing to the state of the other. You know, you've added a table to source control. Now you need to add that table to your database. There's tools that will allow that comparison to take place between those two states and then generate the necessary script to make that upgrade, update, you know, new table happen. That is one mechanism. The other mechanism is called migrations also called manifest or manifest of changes and that one is pretty simple it is a series of scripts that have to be run in a particular order and um, do that <laughs> right run those scripts in that order now the strength of state is that it's really simple to implement it is really simple to understand it is quick however it has a few weaknesses the weaknesses are that it doesn't deal well. Any of the tools, any of the state comparison tools, don't deal well with breaking changes. Um, the classic is splitting a column, right? That's the classic example. I know that we don't split columns very often, but uh, if you adding adding a, let's say adding a column that's not null, but you don't have default values, so you need to work that into the script as a way to add the the values and stuff it is problematic for comparison tools to read your mind and figure out what it is that you wanted to do in this situation. Whereas with a migrations approach, the strengths of migrations is you define the mechanism of deployment and you define the order in which the deployment occurs and the tool just manages things for you and it tracks what deployments it's done, what deployments it hasn't done, and ensures that your databases are all up to date. The only issue that migration introduces, and it does introduce some, um, the complexity of having to do that extra work of, of tracking things yourself and maybe generating some or even all of the scripts yourself, um, that's one, but two, it is possible for development to leak into the manifest of changes, meaning in a development process, we, we may change a column or change a table 15 or 20 times before we're like really ready for it to be deployed. And you might find that your migrations tooling or your migrations approach adds a column, drops a column 20 times because you know all those changes we made in dev and then finally arrives at, a, at a, 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 a good place where you want to be, but deploying that into a production environment where there's millions of rows in a table would be extremely problematic. So you certainly don't want to do that. But um, that's, that's the big shortness for, week, uh, in, in, for migrations. It's, it's the complexity and then the potential of not putting in the, the scripts correctly and, and leaking dev into, into your prod environments. So you, you want to be cautious about that, very cautious about that. However, my preference today, now, um, unless I'm talking very small systems, my preference, especially, and this is especially true for very large systems, my preference is uh, migrations. It is a lot of work to set up, some work to understand, um, but then easier over the long term. So that's that's where I like to go. And and it does work way better for big, big systems. Um, it also works better for large teams. Uh, large teams state based becomes very problematic. So um, that's that's my that's my advice there. Now as to specifically which tools, there are a whole bunch of different vendors. Redgate software makes some of the tools. Um, but today what I'm going to actually demo is an open source tool. So I'm going to show you something that doesn't cost you any money. Um, you can get into it and start working with it no cost up front and, and off you go and um, works great so that's what we'll be talking about today but there are a whole bunch of other tools out there I'm not gonna list them all um, you guys can go look them up now where are we deploying to 
well, where we're deploying to is wherever you want to deploy to. Um, the example today, I'm going to deploy from Azure, I'm going to deploy locally to a PostgreSQL database running running um, inside a container on my own laptop. But uh, I could just as easily go, you know, especially working with Azure DevOps, I could just as easily go to Azure SQL database, Azure managed instance. I could do Azure DB for Mirai. I could do Azure DB for Postgres. I don't have to be running a Postgres locally. The reason I've set it up that way from Azure is just to demo the fact that I can come back down to my client. I don't have to, you know, by saying, oh, well, I'm doing Azure DevOps. Well, that's it. If we're not doing all Azure, then we can't do Azure DevOps. Now, the reason I'm showing it is because I want you to see that, in fact, we can deploy to client-based stuff outside of Azure. It is entirely possible, uh, easy even. So um, the other things that we could deploy to, SQL Server instances in VMs, SQL Server instances on Iron down locally, um, Oracle VMs, Cosmos DB, the list is long, right? Any way you want to do it, you can get it done. So, any other questions, go ahead and type them into the windows down below. We'll try to take care of those. Otherwise, I'm going to switch over and we're going to start doing some demos. Now, as part of that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the camera off because my screen and, and you guys, you guys are right there. My screen is right there. So, I'm, instead of turning away from you and being rude, I'm just going to turn the camera off for now. I'll turn it back on in a little bit. Okay, so we need to go and take a look at... All right, so this is my Azure DevOps instance, and I've got several different projects. Um, some of them are better set up than others. These are Some of them are for play, some of them are for learning, and some of them are for demos purposes. Um, we're going to focus today on the Postgres um, example. That's the one we'll be using. But um, first, I want to show you the Hamshack Radio one. We're just going to walk through a couple of little details in here. The pipelines, let's go take a look at those. Now I've got multiple pipelines set up here. Now my first pipeline, let's go ahead and just click on edit. This pipeline is a continuous integration pipeline. But the one thing I want to show is, is that I've got my continuous integration pipeline set up so that it will just do deployments as code changes occur. And that's the triggering mechanism. And that's part of the pipeline definition is determining how each um, pipeline is triggered. This one is based on code changes checked into source control, a push to source control. And the first thing it does, though, is it runs a test for code coverage. It validates, uh, it uses an open source tool called SQL Cop, um, but it validates my code inside of my SQL Server instances before it tries to do a deployment. Then, based on the fact that it's um, a successful validation, it then does a build to the database. So that's that's this one's a little different. Um, I just wanted to show it to you just so you get an example of, of one kind of pipeline. Now I've got another kind of pipeline. This is my QA build. And in this case, let's go ahead and hit edit. In this case, it's a slightly different one. What I'm doing is I'm having it build test objects. This one is triggered by the other one. Once a successful CI build is done, so it's passed the code coverage, it then runs a build to validate that you know it can build the database. Once that's complete, it comes back in and then builds uh, the database for my QA system. So that's you know again another kind of step, another kind of set of triggers. So that's the important thing to remember is that there's lots of ways to do this, but um, not not all of them are wrong. Not all of them are right, but you get the idea. And then finally, I've got a build to pre-prot. And you can see that one was successful last time I ran it. Let's go to edit. Now this one's doing a whole bunch of work. It's, it's stuff not related to what we're talking about today. But the basic idea here at the end is, is that it does create an artifact. The other ones do not create an artifact. It's automated CI build locally. Um, it's an automated QA build to my QA system. This one is a build to my pre-production system, but what it does do is it creates an artifact. And the reason it creates an artifact is, is because generally, in my imaginary process that I've set up here, 
what we're doing is, is we're generating an artifact that we are then going to run against our production system. But by stopping here where we have the artifact, we can then review the artifact before we go to production. And so that's the idea on this imaginary pipeline. And the reason I'm showing you all these is because I want you guys to get an idea of what's possible, not necessarily what you have to do, but what's possible to do. Um, this is just one set of possible pipelines, one set of possible flow. Um, and that's, that's all there is to that, really. Now, the next thing I want to show you is the repository. Now, in this case, I've got, like I said, I've got my repository locally. By going to the repo, you can see um, we can take a look at the commits that have occurred. And so this is going to show you all the various commits. And you'll notice um, I am doing branching. I am doing merging on a regular basis. And um, I've got all kinds of different stuff. Make sure you're commenting as you go. Now, if you look over here on the right, you can see that I've had a lot of failed builds. It's because I was doing some experimentation and some changes and trying out different stuff, and they weren't always working. You'll notice I, I was very consistent for a while, but then I, and then I went into an area where I was getting a lot of failures. It's pretty common. It's normal stuff. But um, you can take a look at the pushes, all the pushes that have, have occurred. You can take a look at the branches and how they've gone. Right now we've only got the main branch. Um, but we can take a look at the files, and we can see the files we can see any changes to the files that have occurred over time, and it just breaks down like that. There's nothing special or magical about these. These are just, you know, the files. Now we can take a look at the history, and it's going to show us the changes that have occurred just to this file over time. And we can compare one version to another. There's a whole lot of choices in here. So this repository is very full-featured. There's a lot going on. It's got everything we need. Now, when we go to start setting up all of this stuff, the one thing I emphasized over and over again is security. Now, if we take a look at the pipeline, we're going to look at the pipeline in more detail in a minute. What I'm doing is a whole series of PowerShell commands, but we're going to look at that in a second. But what I first wanted to show you is, is that what we can do in terms of security. You can set up individual groups. You can customize this all yourself. Now, right now, I am, I've got a single login. That single login has got access to everything. It's an admin across the board. But we can set it up so you've got contributors, and then we can go in there and say, you know, contributors are allowed to update build information, or they're allowed to view the build pipeline, or they're allowed to view builds. We've got control over all of this. You can see that there are readers set up, and you can adjust that as needed. Um, you can set up project collection managers, project build managers, Anything that you need, you can decide exactly how you want to determine it and then set it up. Now, the agents are all set up through these agent pools. They're set up through your organization. Your organization has a series of commands and methodologies that it's going to use to set these up. Now, right now, I've got three agents set up. One of them is offline. This is a virtual machine. Um, when the virtual machine is, is asleep, or, or turned, up, turned off, then the agent itself is turned off. But then I have the other two, um, my desktop, which is running today, and then uh, another machine, which is also running just fine. We can use multiple agents. We can use pools. You can use lots of agents. You can, so you could set up a deployment so that it, it goes to like, you know, if you have like a thousand servers you want to deploy one database change to, you can do that by setting up a thousand agents and ensuring that those thousand agents get all of the stuff they need. Um, and that's just how, you, how it goes. It's uh, really important, the agent version. Keep these ver agents up to date. Um, I should run this soon, update all agents. Um, my, other, my local agent, it's on the latest. I do let it au update automatically. Um, the other ones, you will have to push to them when you want them. But basically, all of these are controlled. Um, you can take a look at the details on, and you can see the process going on. You can look at the security and the permissions that these that that is um, that are controlled through the agents. You can defer time and settings, and you can take a look at maintenance history. Now, the jobs you'll see the jobs that have been running, success and failure, and all the ones across all the time that show off how things have been running. So that's the agents. The agents are really important if you're doing all that local kinds of deployment. But you're still going to need one even if you're just deploying to Azure. Um, it'll be an Azure-based agent. It will only be on Azure. 
and and that will control everything that you do from there so that's that now let's take a look at our pipeline yeah we don't need that cool so we talked about pipelines and we talked about the things you can do with pipelines let's talk about the pipeline I have set up here now this is the simplest pipeline I could set up I wanted to make things real simple nothing complex no real surprises for anyone and this is what I would recommend anyone do are these exact three steps maybe maybe not it's up to you because it determines it's more determined by where where your database is living um, what kind of databases are we talking about as I said this is a continuous integration um, process that I'm running and it allows me to control what's going on in, in terms of the pipeline but um, what I'm doing is first is I'm resetting my PostgreSQL um, continuous integration database by reset what I mean is I am creating um, a docker container called HSRCI and so Hamshack Radio is the, is the name of my project and CI because it's a continuous integration um, it's local I've got it mapped per, to a particular port and so I run that docker container um, for some reason I do have to make it sleep for six, six seconds I don't know why but I've noticed if I do that everything works better uh, the next thing I have to do is create a database um, in this case I am NOT working with data uh, over time your CI process your continuous integration process you are probably going to want to integrate data into it but short term um, immediate term I'm for the first time setting up database automation make your life easier don't deal with data day one Day two, after you've got this running, you know how it works, you're ready to go, you've, you've figured out all the mechanisms and methodologies, cool. Then we go on and introduce data. But until then, you keep it low, you keep it easy, um, you keep it simple, and no data added. So I'm going to just go in, connect up to it, and create a database. And that's it. It's nice and simple. Create a container, create a database on that container. And before we leave this step, let's just take a look at the YAML so you can see that in action. So we can see that the steps are defined. Um, the code is, you know, within them is exactly what, you know, I said it was going to be. And it shows, you know, the same stuff, but this is the YAML. Uh, so you can take a look at it and, and see what's going on with that. And we can copy it to the clipboard and do everything you need from there. And you can control this very directly if you need to. You can control it programmatically if you need to. And you'll probably need to eventually. So getting used to the idea of, of using the YAML uh, for these processes is a good idea. Next, I am running... Um, I am running a Flyway Migrate. Funny enough, that's not... <laughs> that is um, I am connecting up to that local host the 5498 to that Hamshack radio database that we created with the user and the password and everything I need and then I am running flyway migrate and flyway is how we do the deployments so we're just gonna save this we don't need to queue it and then finally I am stopping the HSRCI and then dropping it so it's that container that I created is created, the flyway deployment occurs, and then the um, that container is removed. So I don't keep it over time. Now the one thing I will say is, is that I do output, um, I create an artifact. It's created locally, just down here on my C drive, um, but um, it's just one example of how you can get these things done. Um, do you have to do it that way? No. Uh, I just like to give you guys lots of examples and show you, you know, lots of different ways to go through this process. All right, let's go over and take a look at a demo. Let's see this stuff in action. Oops. All right, let's see this stuff in action. Now, what we've got here is the HSR Postgres. Um, these are all the files um, that I've created in the past, um, various things, including a little bit of PowerShell. We can actually run PowerShell through um, directly through our, our um, deployment mechanisms. but what we're focused on here is we need to make a change. Uh, what we found is, is that our connectors table and our radios table do not have primary keys. 
Um, that's a problem. <laughs> Primary keys are kind of necessary on tables. So what we're going to do is alter those two tables and add a primary key to them. So to do that, what we want to do is save this file. Now what I've got to do is save it using this standard naming convention that's going on here. We're going to do file v7 and then we are adding primary keys. So there, we've now added some new primary keys to our table, and that's great. Let's go back over here and take a look at, this is my source control, and so I've now it now knows that I've made a change. It's I've added this particular file. So what we're going to do is go ahead and stage that change so that it's ready to go into my source control system. And then we are going to say adding primary keys to tables that were, miss Oops. were missing. Cool. All right, so that's all set. We can go ahead and commit that change now. Now with that change committed, what I've done is I've added a change, but I've added a change locally. This is on my local repository. This is not out on my production repository. This is on my local. And so my local repository now has a history of changes. And so I can keep working locally, keep getting my work done, and I'm not going to affect any of my teammates because I haven't yet pushed this up to our centralized Git repository. Let's go ahead and take care of that now. Click here, hit push, and now that's going off to Git and it is going up into the cloud. We can validate that. If we go over here and take a look, we'll go to the repos and we'll take a look at the SQL. And sure enough, there is our script as written. There's the alter tables and all added in with the right name and everything else. That is now in our repository. Now, in the meantime, while that's happening, our pipeline is triggered by these pushes. So if you'll notice, this is now running. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what's going on. It's actively running. We can even drill down and look at the details. Let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on. And it's actually pretty much almost done here at this point. So what it's doing is, is it's um, initialized the job, takes less than a second. Um, it's just getting things going. It knows what it's happening, which agent is running, all that stuff. It then checks out source control. Cool. It then restores the Postgres database. So it runs that command that we told it to run. And it's defined it as a PS1, so it's running through the agent, and it's running PowerShell through the agent. We can't see exactly what it's doing, but we get the idea. It's then creating the database using Flyway, and we can see the command here, so it made that command. The output we have is absolutely doing what it says it will do. And so it's generating um, 21 migrations, all of the stuff, the, the PowerShell, um, the version 7, the repeatables, um, all of that stuff all occurs all at once, all out to my database. It was successful, which is great. So after that, we then run the next command to remove my um, um, container. And then it, you know, the post job does all the rest of the stuff to finish up everything going on. And that's it. So it ran through the entire thing successfully, and it did it while we were talking. Because once I did that push from over here in my source control system, once I pushed that change in, it went into my repository. <clears throat> once it was in my repository, my pipeline, which we looked at earlier, let's go ahead and edit it again, the pipeline was triggered by that change, and we can take a look at the triggers. So it's enable continuous integration, goes from the, the main branch, and it just automatically runs based on that trigger. And we can add other triggers or we can do other things as needed, but you get the general idea. Okay, so let's go back to our slides.
And let's go ahead and turn on the camera. There we go. Okay, let's put it all together. What I started with was Visual Studio Code. And in Visual Studio Code, we had some changes to our tables. We added new primary keys to our tables. Uh, they were missing, so we added them. That was in Visual Studio Code. That's where I was working. That's where I was getting my job done locally. Uh, could we do it other places? Of course we could. But, but in our example that we ran through, we were working locally in Visual Studio Code. From Visual Studio Code, we went into our Git repository, but we went first to our local repository. So we have history locally. Cool. We did a push up to Azure. So now the changes that we made after validating them locally are pushed up to Azure. Great. Azure then fires the pipeline. And we saw the trigger on the pipeline was continuous integration based on a particular repository, based on a particular branch in that repository. We then were able to run our pipeline. Our pipeline created a container locally, created a database on that container, ran Flyway, which we see there, and deployed our database. And that deployment was entirely successful. Yay us. We win. And then finally, we generated an artifact. We generated that SQL artifact that we could then eyeball if we wanted to, to see what changes were occurring, how they were occurring, and what kind of stuff was going to go on. So we ran through all of this. All of this was done all at once, all in an automated fashion. And the real key to think about is, is that from my standpoint, as an individual contributor, not someone who's responsible for all of the, all the rest of the things that happened, all I did was work locally on Visual Studio Code. Everything else, all the rest of the processing, occurred without my engagement, without my involvement, without my activity. It all occurred in the background. So our continuous integration process is fully automated in a way that I don't have to worry about it. It's just going to occur. Now, best of all, when it finished, this repository, uh, this process actually sent an email, sent an email to my local email, and that email told me it, it's success or failure. And we can do that for all of it. We can, we can ensure that, that it sends out emails to our group, to our team, to the business, wherever it is that we need it to go. We can make sure that all of that occurs. And so you, we've got a lot of options there, a lot of ways to mess around with it. Um, there are more pipelines we could create. I, I showed you a couple of examples. I showed you two different mechanisms of doing continuous integration, one of which included testing to validate the code before it did the deployment. A nice idea. Um, another showed you a QA build so we could build out to our QA system. We could then add automated testing as needed. Um, another showed a build to a pre-production environment with the generation of an artifact so we can either reuse that artifact in production deployments or at least eyeball it to understand what's going to happen when that same set of changes runs on production. Either way, we've got a lot of control and a lot of processing that we can do. And it's all about going back to those fundamentals. Your team, the collaboration in support of the process, and the tools in support of the process. But it's about your team and your people first, right? We cannot get away from that idea. It is the team and the people first and then everything else second. Okay, so that's, that's it in a nutshell, right? That's, that's the stuff that we were gonna to cover today. With that, hopefully we hit our agenda. We went through and talked about how to integrate database DevOps into Azure, and, and it, 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 is, it is conceptually easy. It is just a question of, of picking the tool that you wanna use. In my case, I used the open source Flyway, and creating the commands that will allow you to run that tool. Um, sometimes there are plugins in Azure that let you run it, um, or other times you're just going to call your command line, whether you're calling Bash, PowerShell, doesn't matter. The, the, the agents and stuff can run on multiple systems. They can run on Linux. They can run on Windows. So you can set it up any way you need to. So we've, we've got that idea of, of databases, DevOps in Azure, right? All the, together. We talked about the tooling that's going to help you get the job done, especially repositories, right? We start in a repository, 
If it's not in the repository, it doesn't exist, right? If it's not in source control, it doesn't exist. That has to be the mantra by which you begin to live. This is how most application developers are already living. Um, now database developers and DBAs have to start thinking that way too. Um, and then we've shown a whole bunch of examples of manipulating databases through these processes, uh, through these automation mechanisms and um, through the tools provided. So hopefully we hit these goals, hopefully we hit this agenda and uh, you guys are happy. Again, if there are questions after today, please use my contact information, which is right here. Um, reach out if you've got questions, I'd like to try to answer them. It's my email, my blog, my Twitter handle. Get in touch with me. Um, I will try to answer any kind of questions or doubts you've got. That's it. Um, thank you to Microsoft. Thank you to the data platform geeks and SQL Server geeks. Uh, you guys are a great community. I really appreciate the opportunity to take part in your event again. Um, I hope um, someday when you guys go back to the in-person events, I can get out there again. I uh, really enjoyed it the last time I was there, and I'd like to go again. Do not forget to make sure that you um, do your three ways to prizes. Um, post your selfie while you're watching this stuff. Use the hashtag. And please do give um, feedback to all the people that you attend. Um, if, if you like their sessions, that's great. Tell them you liked it. If you had a problem with the session, go ahead and tell them you had a problem with it, but tell them why you had a problem with it. Um, don't just say, oh, it, it stunk. Um, tell them why. Um, because understanding why things were not appreciated allows people to improve, right? That's that's the key. And so feedback is a gift. If you got something out of the sessions, the gift you can give back is some feedback. So please do that. Um, follow the Data Geeks on, on um, Twitter. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for attending my session. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got some information out of it. And that's it. My name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Mm -hmm.